Okay, so for some background, I'm a female, and when the story takes place, I was a junior in high school, so I was about 16 to 17 throughout the story. I'm now a sophomore in college, so this was about four years ago. I get to school on the first day, and my Italian teacher is new. He wasn't old, maybe only about 25 or 26, and he looked nice enough, not visibly creepy. He was pretty short, maybe only about 5 foot 7, and I'm 4 foot 11 and 100 pounds, so basically everyone is bigger than me. We'll call this teacher Mr. C. Fast forward a month or two, I remember it was just starting to get cold out. Everything in this class has been pretty normal. I do notice he basically only calls on girls and stands a little too close, but nothing too out of the ordinary. I did the musicals in high school, so I would often be there until about 9 or 10 p.m. rehearsing. This one particular day, there were parent-teacher conferences, so basically all the teachers were there very late. For musical nerds like me, we were doing Legally Blonde and I was playing Margot, one of Ellie's friends. My costume for this scene was a little raunchy. It was a short white tennis skirt with an athletic tank top and some converse. I also had on a little pink bow in my hair, and that part is important. So I have to pee really badly, so I walk quickly to the closest bathroom, which was up a floor and down the hall. Mr. C's room happened to be a few doors down from the girls' bathroom. Most of the teachers had finished their conferences by the time and had left. I saw a light on in Mr. C's room, so I glanced over and he was sitting in there by himself, packing up his stuff. I didn't think he noticed me, and I kept walking till I got to the bathroom. I did my business, and as I was finishing up, I heard the bathroom open. I thought it was weird, but just assumed it was one of my castmates. But the footsteps sounded a little too loud to be a high school girl's. So I walked out of the stall, and literally just standing there in the bathroom was Mr. C. I was just standing there frozen. This was so weird. I tried to say something, but nothing came out. I was honestly freaked. After a few seconds of just staring at each other, he hands me my bow and says, You dropped this cherry. I just gave him a little smile and a quick thanks, grabbing it, and got out of there. I didn't even wash my hands. I was honestly so incredibly freaked out. It wasn't until a few seconds later that I realized he had called me Cherry. This made me stop dead in my tracks. Only my dad calls me Cherry because I had red hair as a little kid. It's brown now. Literally no one knew about that nickname, not even my friends. My dad had passed away eight years ago. I started running until I got back to my castmates. My friend, Ava, noticed that I looked shaken up. She asked me what was wrong and I just broke down crying. It wasn't really about my creepy teacher, more about the memories of my father, I suppose. She quickly took me into an empty classroom and sat with me while I cried. After I had gotten out most of my tears, I told her everything that had happened. She was livid, but I convinced her not to tell anyone because I was embarrassed. I know, I'm an idiot. She didn't have Mr. C, but stopped by my class with him once to grab my car keys when her art project was in my car. She told me later when we were driving home that he had looked at me really weirdly. She said it was the way a predator looks at its prey. Yeah, huge red flags everywhere, but I was super innocent and just generally naive at the time. After this, nothing happened for another month or two. I had honestly forgotten about everything, but I still remember the day of my life changed forever. The day everything started. January 16th. I had just gotten home from school and went on Facebook. I had a friend request from a guy named Jake. He was super attractive and a few people from my school were friends with him, so I assumed he went to a school in a nearby town. I shrugged and accepted his request. What I did notice was weird was that he had about five photos, all posted in the last two days, but I ignored it. So basically five seconds after I accepted, I get a message from this Jake kid. He says, Hi cutie, with a winky face. I was shocked that this cute guy was messaging me, so I messaged back saying hi and asking if he lived in my town. He said he did, but went to a private school. We talked for hours, and we both had so much in common. We loved to draw, had two older siblings, our parents were both remarried, our favorite color was both periwinkle, we both loved Billy Joel. 
the list went on and on. It was honestly pretty strange. He asked me if I wanted to hang out, and I said yes, but that I had cheer practice and then rehearsal right after. He sounded pretty angry and told me that I was lying, and then called me a derogatory term. He sent me about a hundred messages about how I was disgusting, and I started panicking and just blocked him. It's like something flipped so quickly in him, and it was honestly terrifying. I tried my best to ignore it and went to cheer practice. Cheer was from about 5.30 to 7, and then I had rehearsal from 7.15 to 9.30. Ava and I planned to grab something from McDonald's in our 15-minute break. In the middle of cheer, Ava sprained her ankle, so her mom came to pick her up. After I finished cheer practice, I decided I would just go to McDonald's by myself. It was freezing, and I was in a tiny cheer uniform, so I ran to my SUV and hopped inside. I clicked to push the start button, and nothing happened. What? That was strange. I tried again a few more times with no success. I called my stepdad and he said I should just leave my car there and go back inside and he would pick me up from rehearsal and check out my car. I was honestly so angry about not getting my chicken nuggets that I hadn't even realized that I never unlocked my car. I know 100% that I locked it, but I didn't have to unlock my car to get back in. I didn't figure this out until weeks later and actually cried when I realized because that meant that someone had actually messed with my car. I bought this car myself so it was kind of my baby. I was so angry and stomped my way back inside having no clue why my car wouldn't start. I kid you not, the second I walk inside, I slam right into Mr. C. I had no idea why he was still at school. The only other teacher here was my drama director so he really shouldn't have been there. Sorry, I murmured, quickly walking away when I felt a hand grab my arm, like honestly really tight and I even winced. He pulled me back to him and asked if I was okay. I said I was fine, but my car wouldn't start and his face literally lit up. It was actually really creepy. He said, I was actually headed to McDonald's if you wanted to come with me. This is when I started to freak out. How did he know I was going to McDonald's? Why was he asking me, a child, to come with him to McDonald's? That was not normal at all and I felt pretty scared. Um, I actually have rehearsal. Thank you though. His face quickly changed from happiness to extreme anger. I really got terrified of what this man was planning. His grip was still on my arm and I felt trapped. He took a deep breath and said, Well, I'll be waiting here after your rehearsal, and we can go after. I have a black pickup truck. He quickly walked away to make sure I didn't have time to answer. I just stood there in shock, not knowing what was going on. My friend, Maya, suddenly appeared saying my director was looking for me and I needed to come to rehearsal. I quickly sped off with her, trying to figure out if I was going insane or if that had actually happened. After rehearsal, I was so genuinely terrified that I asked my stepdad to come to a different entrance because I said I was exhausted and asked if we could go get my car tomorrow. He reluctantly agreed. On the way home, we passed my car and sitting right next to it was a black pickup. I just about stopped breathing but tried to calm down not to show my stepdad. Again, a dumb move on my part, I should have just came straight forward. The next day I received a text from an unknown number when I woke up. It said it was from Jake and he apologized, everything saying he was having girl troubles and was so sorry. Like the idiot I was, I accepted it and we began talking again. After a little bit I mentioned the school that I went to and he said his uncle worked there. I was shocked and asked who. I don't even know what I was expecting but of course he said Mr. C. He then sent a blurry picture of a man and a teen boy fishing at a lake, and the man was obviously Mr. C, but the boy was not this Jake kid. Like it was someone completely different, and even in a different ethnicity, and then I realized that this person I was talking to was Mr. C. I immediately powered off my phone and just started crying. I was so freaked out. My mom walked into my room with my laundry and saw me sobbing. She asked what was wrong and I broke down and told her everything. She flipped her lid, called the cops, talked to my school. 
and the next day, Mr. C wasn't in class. I found out a few weeks later that they found a ton of illicit images of children on his computer, and when they asked what his intentions were with me, he flat out said that he was in love with me, wanted to get me pregnant, steal me, and marry me. Yeah, I'm still very traumatized after a few years. I know my story isn't as crazy as some people's, but it could have been much, much worse. I moved to a town with my parents my freshman year in high school. There's this alarm that goes off every time the fire department is called. For those of you in Tornado Alley, you'll know it as a tornado alarm, but up here in New England, just there to alert the town and or volunteers that there's a fire because it's a small town. I grew up in Tornado Alley, and the first time we heard the alarm, my family went into full panic mode. It's also the sound from Silent Hill for you horror fans. One afternoon, I was walking home from the park, and it got dark fast. As a 14-year-old girl, I thought I was pretty much an adult by this point, and in a small redneck northeastern town, I didn't really feel scared walking home 15 years ago now. I was about half a block from the fire station as a red old Toyota truck pulled up and offered me a ride home. I politely said that I was fine as this old greasy guy just gave me the absolute creeps. He kept driving slowly by me till he noticed that I picked up the pace to a near jog and he began to drive off. Only the drive back towards me minutes later then turn around and drive back up to me. He swung his car door open and started angry walking fast towards me and my heart literally stopped and my body froze like a deer in headlights ready for death. He grabbed my arm hard and started pulling me to his car. I screamed but he covered my mouth with his hands that reeked of sweat and cigars. I wiggled away only to have my head slammed into his truck full force making my ears ring as soon as he got a grip on me again. As he was forcing me into his truck, the fire department alarm blares. For reference, you can hear the alarm a town over. And being only half a block away, it's extremely loud, disorienting if you're not used to it, as it is a very concerning horn siren-like sound. He let go long enough for me to sprint into someone's backyard, and I assume between the sound and possible witnesses now, it wasn't worth it anymore to him. After he drove off, I tried to just sit there and gather myself and my thoughts. A dog in the owner's house started barking at me and a guy in his thirties comes out at some point and asks what I'm doing, eventually noticing a scared girl with blood on her face and then asked if I needed help. I simply shook my head yes. I don't know how long but eventually cops showed up, then an ambulance. Next thing I know I'm in the hospital. My parents are freaking out and I told cops what had happened. As far as I know, they never caught the guy. I had stitches in my head, but thankfully no permanent damage. Cops assumed he wasn't from around here, as we're the only town with that alarm, and probably wouldn't have been startled by it if he was a local. I haven't contacted police in years, but last I checked, they never caught the guy, nor had similar reports, so either he's getting away with it, or his scare with trying to take me scared him off for good from hunting young girls. Growing up in a rural Canadian town to a poor family, my father Dean and his siblings never had much in the way of entertainment. Often left unsupervised, the three children were all too frequently left to their own devices, giving them ample opportunity to indulge in interesting and sometimes dangerous activities. After accumulating several injuries this way, rather than putting their foot down, Dean's parents chose a more hands-off approach. The children's misadventures became all too easy to ignore completely. On a warm summer evening, the sun still burning high in the sky, Dean found himself wandering the neighborhood with three of his good friends who lived nearby. Spending most of the day roughhousing and pulling pranks, the group of kids decided their fun just wasn't over yet and brainstormed on where to play next. One of Dean's friends, Thomas, suggested they go play in the local quarry, as there were plenty of boulders and sand dunes to climb on. Being a year or so older than the boys, Thomas's ideas always seemed like good ones, and so they all headed out to the big pit. 
Upon arriving at the quarry, dunes upon dunes of sand loomed over them, and the group of kids headed straight for the tallest one. They all took turns climbing up and sliding down through the sand. They were having what seemed like innocent fun, and had no idea their fun was about to quickly come to a terrifying end. Atop the dune, Thomas readied himself to slide down to his friends waiting below. Dean and the other two boys, Will and Jason, sat in the lower part of the dune cheering on Thomas, but as he began to slide, their cheers turned into screams of horror. With Thomas came an avalanche of heavy sand, engulfing the three boys entirely. Unable to stop, Thomas rode the wave of sand to the bottom of the dune and quickly realized his friends were all buried alive in his wake. Frantically, Thomas started digging through the sand. A minute passed before he could hear a faint voice from beneath the dirt. He clawed and clawed until he eventually uncovered Dean, out of breath and pale as a ghost. Having been sat higher up on the dune than his two friends, Dean had been fairly close to the surface after the avalanche. The two continued to dig randomly, not knowing where or how deep Will and Jason were in the piles of sand. Realizing the severity of the situation, they knew they needed help. They separated, each running home as fast as they could. Dean burst through the door of his parents' house, yelling that his friends were buried in the quarry and that he desperately needed help digging them out. Covered head to toe in dirt and obviously distressed, his parents took one look at him and shook their heads. Rather than help and concern, he got a lecture. They didn't believe his story at all. He continued to beg them for help, but to no avail. Eventually getting impatient, Dean fled the house to head back to the quarry, hoping that Thomas's parents hadn't been so ignorant. He arrived shortly to find Thomas, his parents, and several neighbors digging furiously through the sand. After several minutes, the boys' bodies were found amongst the dirt, completely limp. It was too late. Ambulances came and officers got details from Dean and Thomas. The two surviving boys never spoke again after the accident. Dean was never given any of the support or resources he needed to deal with the traumatic events that day. He lost his best friends in an instant and has never truly found closure. Some people may not think this is scary, and when compared to being stalked or a house invasion, this isn't scary, but for my life, it was 18 years of torture and still haunts me to this day. When I was born, my parents were part of a Christian church in a small town in Alabama, so from day one I was part of the fundamentalist church, attending services three days a week. And when I turned five, I was enrolled in the school the church was in charge of, it's a very small private school with ages 2 to 18 in one school building. There was the daycare, kindergarten, and preschool, and then when you hit the third grade, you were upgraded to the learning center, where all students from third grade to seniors all shared one room and did their schoolwork together. I'm sure you can imagine how it would be, being an 8-year-old child sent into a world of older, immature, and scary teenagers. I was the only young student the next youngest classmate being 14, so I was essentially 8 years younger than everyone else in class. Our school was very small. Back then, when I first entered the learning center, there were only about 20 students in total from 3rd grade to 12th, so it was not crowded, but there were a lot of things that went on due to the mixture of ages. Our schoolwork was not taught with textbooks, but with small magazine-like booklets that had about 30 pages in each booklet. When you finish the booklet, you took a test on the subject taught in that particular pace, then moved on to the next. Typically, you had to complete 12 booklets a year in each subject. Math, English, Science, History, Bible, and Spelling. If you failed a test, you had to erase all your work from your booklet as punishment for failing, then completely redo all the information until you can pass the test. And the failing grade was 80. Anything under 80 was a failure and that meant you got to erase all 30 to 40 pages that night at home, which took hours and hours to do. And all subjects revolved around Christianity. You learned about the science of how God created the earth, had to learn dozens of scripture verses every year, and even in our math booklets, the word problems had something to do with God. For example, 
Johnny went to the Christian bookstore and bought 16 Bibles and gave 14 of them away to Sunday school friends. How many Bibles did Johnny have left? We were literally suffocated with God, Bible verses, and rules. And that's all we were taught, and that's all that mattered. I was bullied regularly by the upper classes. One day I was force-fed a mixture of Vienna sausages, mashed up pretzels, coke, and mustard, all shoved down my throat in the back room and made to swallow before they left while laughing at me. Other times I would be shoved against walls, hit and teased. They would throw my backpack across the room. I wouldn't be allowed to play with them and in general, I was just an outsider. That caused me to be very lonely and crave the friendship and love of others. But there was no one else. Like I said, I was eight years younger than anyone else, and I was completely alone. Things did change over time. As students would graduate from the school, less and less students were left, and when I entered the ninth grade, I was the only high schooler student left. So, the school staff decided to put first grade students and above into one class. So in one small room, there were four students, me, a 14-year-old, and three seven-year-old kids. So instead of being eight years younger than my classmates, I was seven years older. I'd like to say things got better at this time, but no, things got so much worse. This same year, the preacher's wife became my school teacher, so I did not have a real teacher, just a middle-aged woman that was not trained to be a teacher. In fact, she went to college to be a secretary, so she was not fit at all to be a teacher and coincidentally that same year, the preacher of the cult and his wife changed dramatically after all three of their daughters joined the world. Their oldest, a 28-year-old female, married another female, of course sending her parents an invitation to the wedding, and no, they did not attend. The middle child, a 26-year-old woman, started going to bars and clubs, drank heavily and partied. And lastly, the youngest child, a 23-year-old girl married a boy that her father said she was not allowed to marry because he was sick. In his younger years, he had suffered with seizures, so in the preacher's eyes, he was not fit for a husband. After they became engaged, they more or less disowned their last daughter. All of those things happened to the cult leaders in the same year, so it's an understatement to say they became bitter and angry. Unfortunately for me, I was the one who received that bitterness and anger. My teacher, the preacher's wife, would blame me when other students didn't behave. Yes, I kid you not, when the seven-year-old students did not behave. Go figure. When she would misplace items, she would accuse me of stealing them. If I didn't finish my work appropriately, then I would be given double the homework as punishment. Now, I haven't really gotten to all the rules that we had to obey. These rules have been upheld in the school for years and are still demanded to be followed today. We were actually given rule books at the beginning of the school year, every year, and were made to read them with our parents so we had no excuse to break a rule. Some of the rules are as follows. Girls cannot wear pants, only knee-length dresses or skirts. Boys have to wear a belt and collared shirt every day to school. No worldly music, which is literally anything but gospel. No drinking, no cussing, no tattoos, no smoking. Girls had to have long hair. Boys had to have their hair cut above the ear. You could not hang out with anyone considered worldly. Girls could not touch boys. Boys could not touch girls. No dating till you're in college. You had to go to a Christian college. Other colleges were considered worldly and would lead you away from God. And the best rule of all, no Disney or Pokemon. Oh yes, no Disney. Apparently, Disney taught children at a young age to enjoy rock and rap music and to be disrespectful to authority. And Pokemon? Well, apparently Pokemon was devil-worshipping and witchcraft, teaching you to summon demons and call on the devil for evil powers. You just can't make this stuff up. Now that I have explained a few example rules, let me tell you a few things that really let me know that these sorts of things were not normal. First of all, like I said, I was 14 in a classroom of three seven-year-old children, all boys. I decided on the first day of school I would protect them so they didn't have to go through what I endured all those years. I would laugh, play, say jokes, help them with their schoolwork and just make school as fun as I could for them. They were like my three younger brothers. I really did care about them. They were all I had as companions so I made the best of our time we had together. But some things were just very silly and frustrating. For example, I could not help them button their shirt or tighten their belt after using the restroom. 
One of the boys, V, could not get his belt to tighten right, so I bent down and helped loop his belt through, and my teacher came up and said, get your hands off him, and that I was not being proper and girls should never touch boys for any reason. I mean, come on. It was crazy. Well, whatever. I still made the best of it. I sang songs with them, played hide and seek, and would even occasionally help them cheat when the teacher wasn't looking. No regrets. 8th grade to 10th grade was definitely hard, but by far my hardest year was my 11th grade of high school. I was just wearing down. I couldn't take it anymore. I was at the church 6 days a week, 8 hours a day, then homework after that, and from the mental abuse I was receiving from my teacher, I became depressed. I just didn't care anymore. I barely studied for tests. I wouldn't finish my homework. I'd zone out. I didn't eat. In three months, I lost 25 pounds, and I was just exhausted. I didn't want to go on like this anymore. It even got to the point where I even thought about taking my own life. I'd leave my sister, who was truly my one and only best friend behind, but at least I wouldn't have to go through all that anymore. In the end, I decided to keep pushing through. I cried almost every night. I was so lonely. I felt a deep hole in my heart that I couldn't fill. Nothing was helping. I was at my absolute rock bottom. Then one day, my teacher walked up to me and said I needed mental help because I was forcing myself sick to get sympathy. And with that one sentence, I decided no matter what, I was going to win. I wasn't going to let the cult beat me. They have worn me down, kicked me, stomped me, threatened me, but I won't let them win. I refused. And from that day forward, I started passing my tests. I ignored the rules. I found happiness for myself. I cut my hair. Screw the long hair rules. I decided I wouldn't be going to a Christian college. I wasn't going to marry a preacher. I was going to be everything I knew I was capable of being. And the icing on the cake, you could say, was the day before my senior year began. My teacher, the cult leader's wife, called me and my mother in for a meeting. And right there, in front of other people, in front of my mother, and straight to my face, my teacher told me that there was no way I would pass 12th grade, and she was going to do absolutely nothing to help me. I could not believe it. I haven't even started school, and she's getting me ready for failure. Up until then, my mom didn't really understand what was happening. She knew I was having a hard time, but just didn't have a full grasp on the situation. But now she understood. Things clicked and I finally had her side. I went through my senior year with my three school brothers and I made the best of the year I could. I got healthy, I found my happiness, and I passed, all by myself. Without the helping of my teacher, I passed all my tests. I never failed a year of school and I never gave up. I won. The cult didn't defeat me, like they defeated the other students before me. I graduated at 16, I got past school, and I was so relieved. I didn't get free right then. I still had the church to deal with. And after I graduated, things really changed. I wasn't liked by the staff anymore. They didn't consider me part of the staff. I wasn't trustworthy. In fact, they turned against me completely. I was told I couldn't work with the children anymore. I needed more preaching. So I was forbid to work with my children, and on top of that, I was actually told I could not be with the teenagers anymore. I was still 16 to 17 years old, but I could just stay with the adults. They rejected me completely after high school. I played by their rules, I finished my schooling, I was still with the church, I did everything I was supposed to, and they threw me away like trash, just because I said I wouldn't go to Bible college or marry a preacher. That's all it took, and I was nothing. All the adults started looking at me like I was some sort of murderer. Preaching sermons were more heavy on Bible college sermons. And that's when I said I'm done. I would no longer take the abuse. I turned 18, I got a job, and I quit the church. It's been a few years since I've been to the church now. I live about one mile from the cult church. I drive past it several times a week, and I still have nightmares about it. Things have gotten so much better since I left the cult found the most amazing man, I got married. I've come out of my shell. I work independently, I'm my own boss, and I'm happy. I want my life story to be a warning to anyone else out there who has gone through similar things. It's hard. I know it's hard. I understand. And you are not alone. 
It'll get better. Never quit fighting. You are stronger than they are, and you can win. Like I stated at the very beginning, my story isn't filled with ghosts, ghouls, murderers, or stalkers, but it's filled me with true life horrors that are very real and very dangerous. I was ready to die because of them. They could have killed me, and that's the true horror in my story. I hope anyone who reads my story can find true joy in their life because life really is worth living. You can win. I am a mail carrier here in California. A big part of my job is delivering Amazon packages and as you can imagine, my workload has increased significantly during the pandemic. As per usual, this has increased the number of strange encounters I've had. I have a few to share, but I'll start with one. My current route for the past six months leads me through multiple subdivisions of large, beautiful homes, like swimming pools with hot doves in every yard. Given the pandemic, I've noticed people, mainly older folks, have really taken to coming outside to talk to me across their yards. I don't mind at all, but try to keep it short so I don't fall behind on deliveries. One of my favorite residents is an older lady who I'll call Mrs. Lithgow for the sake of the story. She must be well into her 70s and loves to chat about everything going on in the neighborhood. It's not unusual for her to report back that so-and-so has left their lawn unattended for two months or that they have strange visitors at odd hours. I usually just nod and smile. The house across the street from Mrs. Lithgow was only listed for sale for a few days when it was purchased really quickly. Shortly thereafter, my truck began to fill up with Amazon packages for whoever lived there. Mrs. Lithgow noticed right away and told me a week later that packages would stay in their pile until nighttime and then have disappeared in the morning. This didn't seem strange to me at the time. Mrs. Lithgow became further concerned and began telling me that there always seems to be a lot of screaming coming from the house later in the evening. I hadn't heard anything, but my deliveries were always earlier in the morning. My first strange encounter was dropping off a stack of packages. I loaded my arms way higher than I'm supposed to, in a rush, and was waddling up the path. I felt my foot hit something hard and thought I felt it break. I set the stack down and to my horror, realized I had kicked a bag of garbage that had fallen open. Sticking out of the top was a jar with what looked like animal body parts in it. They had leaked onto the hot stone path and as soon as I had stopped, the smell was unbearable. I also noticed that there was a creepy doll in the bag. I quickly finished my delivery and got out of there. I thought about calling the police, but honestly, I thought maybe it was a fetal pig or something like that, so I talked myself out of it. Mrs. Lithgow approached me a few weeks later, telling me that she had finally met the homeowner. After the whole bottle incident, I was pretty interested to know who lived there. Mrs. Lithgow said it was a petite pink-haired woman who said she was living there with her autistic charge. Mrs. Lithgow thought it was so strange and I couldn't help but agree that this young woman lived there alone with this other person, but no one was ever seen coming or going. I chalked it up to the pandemic and went on with my day. Mrs. Lithgow, however, did not. The next day, she came racing to the side of the road. I had to remind her to stay six feet away, but she was shouting that there had been an incident. Apparently, the woman living in the house and the man she cared for had been spotted outside in the backyard. Kids were playing a few houses down and came running in yelling that the autistic man had threatened to shoot them with arrows after yelling, Do you know who I am? I'll admit, I wanted to know more, but didn't have the time to ask questions. Another time, she told me that pink smoke had billowed out of the house and two people came running out, screaming. After that, I didn't see Mrs. Lithgow after she had left town to visit one of her kids. The house stayed quiet and I continued to leave stacks and stacks of packages there. I began to notice that the names on the packages were often different, lots of times just being Fat Goblin and other weird things. I once ran into two electricians leaving the house. As I passed by them, one of them said, That house is full of cat feces. Full. When my route was slightly altered so their address was later in the day, I also started hearing the yelling that I think Mrs. Lithgow had been referring to. It definitely was a grown man, and he was constantly yelling almost incoherent things like, Black, me calls crying. At first, 
I thought he might have been yelling at me, but several times I noticed he was yelling before I even approached the house. I thought maybe it was linked to his diagnosis. Honestly, none of these occurrences were that weird to me, given some of the other experiences I've had. A few weeks ago, I had to deliver a package that required a signature. I had never actually seen anyone there myself, but I knocked anyways. I heard a small shriek and shuffling about. Concerned, I walked toward the side of the house, but still in front, and yelled, Hello? I need a signature for a package. The shuffling continued. I went back to the front door to knock one last time and leave a note letting them know where they could pick it up. I suddenly heard loud and fast stomping from inside the house. I peeked into the glass of the door to see if someone was coming. It was a stocky man dressed in a spandex suit from head to toe. He waved a gun in the air. I stepped back in shock. I froze just for a second long enough to hear him yell, You're not safe here! That was enough to get me moving again. I turned and began to run. As I raced down the driveway and back into my truck, I could now fully see the man holding his weapon yelling, I shoot the maim! And I just took off. I called my supervisor immediately, but was told there is nothing we can do about it because technically I was on his property and he never directly threatened me. I still think I should have called the police. I began leaving the packages at the end of the driveway and have not heard or seen anyone in that house again. When I was 13 or 14, I lived in the panhandle of Florida with my mom, younger brother, and my stepdad. My mom had been married to him for almost six years now, and I never did feel comfortable alone with him. He was always lazy, smelled bad, and just gave me the creeps. Sometimes it was just little things like he'd stare a little too long or would go out of his way to get me things I had asked my mom for. I know that doesn't really seem to raise any red flags, but... My mom had raised me to be very aware of men being a very small girl. Our small house had a weird floor plan. I won't go into details about the entire house. You just need to know my room was in the very center of the house. I had three doors going into my room. One shared by my brother's room. One going out into the second living room type area my mom used as her bedroom. And the last one going out right next to the bathroom door. Sometimes my brother would go through my room to get to the bathroom when... My mom and stepdad were fighting or doing drugs like they usually did. The bathroom was right up against the wall of my closet. My closet didn't have doors on it and the walls were very thin so a lot of the time I could hear when someone was in there and what they were doing. A while after living there, I had discovered that the bathroom mirror could be slid a few inches to the right or left to reveal a sort of nook, which I thought was kind of weird. But the people who lived in the house before me were extremely weird so I didn't think much of it. A few weeks go by after I discovered the secret compartment in the bathroom and I was just sitting in my room playing games on my laptop when I heard some kind of scratching noise coming from the closet. I thought it was some kind of rodent because our house really was that bad off. I decided not to pay any attention to it. A few months later I heard my stepdad's footsteps leave the bathroom. Then I started to realize that maybe he too knows about the secret compartment. Curiosity rushes over me and I decided I needed to know what he might have hid back there. I quietly rushed into the bathroom and locked the door behind me. First, I thought maybe he was just trying to hide drugs or money from my mom, which wouldn't be surprising. I felt my heart beating out of my chest when I slowly pushed the mirror to the side. Curiosity became shock when I realized what he had done. It was his phone, propped up by a piece of cardboard. The phone's camera was pointed to the small crack between the mirror and the wall, having a clear view of the shower and toilet. Anger took over me and I snatched the phone, quickly unlocking it by looking at the previous fingerprints. It wasn't recording, but taking a series of pictures which I knew he was controlling with his computer because he was good at computer stuff and hacking. I scrolled through his camera roll to find tons of pictures of me getting into the shower and using the toilet. I was furious. I hid the phone in my pocket, put the mirror back and stormed into the living room looking for my mother. My stepdad was the only person in the living room so I asked him where she was, trying to keep my voice calm and steady. Outside. He said, 
He made a face like maybe he somehow knew I had found his phone. He could have been watching me from his computer this whole time, but I didn't care. I walked outside to find my mom on the porch. I slammed the door and sat down next to her. I pulled the phone out of my pocket and showed her all of the pictures. She grabbed the phone and stormed inside to confront my stepdad, who was already panicking. My mom was screaming at him and I started crying. I don't remember exactly how it happened, but somehow my stepdad had gotten a hold of his phone and my mom was in my room comforting me. My stepdad had come into the room and was saying that there was nothing on it and I could go through it if I wanted to, but I already knew he had deleted everything. I took the phone from him and threw it against the wall. My mom screamed at him to leave the room. It's been six years since then and she never reported or even left him. I've lived with other family for three years already and rarely get to see her because when she does come around, she brings my stepdad with her and I just hide in my room with the door locked. I never forgave him and I have never trusted another man since. I'm currently a 24-year-old male living in the Midwest. The occurrence I'll be describing in this story happened often in my childhood all the way up until I left home for college. My parents have lived in the same southeast Illinois home ever since I was born. The bedroom that my baby crib was in was on the ground floor just down the hall from my parents' bedroom. The house is a two-story log cabin with a basement. I am my parents' first child of three, so when my little brother was born... I had to move out of my bedroom and into one of my storage rooms upstairs which my dad cleaned out and made into a bedroom. This is when I was 5 years old and I was pretty excited to have a whole room to myself on the second floor. I'm not exactly sure when the first occurrence was but I'm sure it wasn't long after I moved bedrooms. It didn't happen every night but I remember it very clearly so it must have been pretty often. I would wake up sometime between 3 and 5 in the morning to the sound of country music being played. It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. Keep in mind that the way my parents' cabin was built, when you exited my bedroom and went left, there was a sort of balcony that overlooked the living room and the kitchen slash dining room. So after hearing the music, I would get out of bed, go to the balcony and look out into the dark rooms to see if my dad was awake and had music on since he loved country music. He never was. When I asked him about it, he said that he never played music if someone was sleeping in the house. So after the first occurrence, I kind of just forgot about it since it didn't really freak me out that badly. This was the only first time of many that this would happen. I would wake up hearing that country music playing very often, but I could never find the source. Usually once I was back in bed, the music would go away and it would be quiet just like any regular house. You might not think that this story is that scary, but... I have one more detail I have yet to mention. Around the time I started middle school, my parents had had my little sister who now moved into the baby crib room. It was also a chance for me to move bedrooms since my brother also wanted to move. So I actually chose to move into the basement bedroom. Strange choice, I know. And my brother moved into the second floor bedroom that I moved out of. Fast forward about 12 years. I've graduated college and have my first real job in my career. My brother is getting ready to start college. There was one day that he was visiting me and we were talking about funny things that happened in the past and I brought up the country music I used to hear. When I mentioned the music, my brother turned and looked at me with a look of pure fear on his face. You heard that too? I told him about the hundreds of nights I would wake up to the music and he said that he had the exact same experience in that bedroom. No other member of my family ever reported this occurrence except me and my brother who were the only occupants of that bedroom. I don't know if this is a supernatural experience or anything, but I can't rule it out. My parents are not the first owners of that cabin and I don't know anything about any of the previous owners. If anyone has any explanation to this, I'd be happy to hear. First of all, let me start by saying, I know there's a lot of skeptics out there. Hell, until recently, I was like you. Ghosts, demons, the paranormal belonged in the movies or in Stephen King novels. I never imagined that I would be sitting here 
talking about an actual paranormal experience that happened to me. Something that I will never be able to forget for as long as I live. I'm a night janitor working in a small hospital that was built just before the Civil War. I've heard some creepy stories about this place, but until recently, I'd never experienced anything paranormal. This one particular night, I was cleaning over in the East Block, which hadn't had any staff or patients in for almost a week due to renovations. My supervisor had asked me to go in and mop up the floor because the workers had left muddy boot prints all over the hall. As I was mopping, I heard footsteps. I looked up and almost had a heart attack. There was an old man in a hospital gown standing at the end of the hall. He was just staring at me. I'd never seen this type of gown before. He looked very old fashioned. I called out to him. Um sir, you're not supposed to be over here. He didn't say anything. He just stood there. I leaned the mop against the wall. Let me show you how to get to... But he was gone. Like I said, I didn't believe in the paranormal. I just assumed he was a patient that had gotten lost. I walked down the dark hallway to the end. It's the elevator lobby. The elevators were out of order, so I quickly ran up the staircase knowing I'd catch him. I mean, this gentleman looked to be in his late 70s, but nothing. I went back down to the lobby, knowing there was only one other place he could have gone. The basement. The basement at the hospital used to be the morgue right up into the 1920s, but now serves as a place for storage. I opened the door and peered down the dark staircase. It was pitch black at the bottom. I flipped the light switch and the fluorescent bulb flickered on. Excuse me, sir? Again, no response. At this point, I began feeling a little uneasy. Maybe because I was on my own, or because I was following some patient into a dimly lit basement. Either way, I descended the staircase. The basement is fairly large, with another staircase at the far end, and mainly nothing but junk and spare hospital beds in between, with storage containers and old furniture, covered by large white dust sheets. It's like a maze down there. Everything was silent. And then, I heard a crash coming from my left. I moved through the clutter and found the old door to the morgue. I opened it up, expecting to find the old man, but he wasn't there. There was a box of books that had fallen from a table. I quickly flipped the light switch on, but it didn't work. I started to get goosebumps and a feeling of pins and needles in my arms. It was freezing down there, but again, it's an old basement so that's to be expected. And then I saw him. His silhouette standing in the corner of the room. He just looked like a shadow, completely still, but facing my direction. Um, sir? You're, um, you're not supposed to be down here, I mumbled. He stood there, emotionless, his eyes just fixated on me. Then, he very slowly started moving towards me. I felt the hairs on my arms stand up. I knew this wasn't right, so I ran. I ran as fast as I could out of the basement. I told my supervisor about what I'd seen, and apparently I wasn't the first to mention this apparition. I did some research on the place, and although I didn't find any pictures or information on the apparition I saw, I did find an old picture of some patients at the hospital from 1911, all wearing the same gown that the old man was wearing. This might not have had the big jump scare ending you may have been expecting, but this is my terrifying story that I wanted to share with you. Sometimes things are just creepy and unexplainable, and that's all we have. I'd like to give a big thank you to Let's Read for having me as a guest on his incredible channel. I've been a big fan of his for a while now, and I truly appreciate his terrifying content. Thank you for having me. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. 
and join a live stream to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... Come with me into the void.